This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Committee Room 29. Okay, members, welcome to the public session of our Education Committee today. Can I ask Assembly Broadcasting to add all members into the spotlight for the next four items? Agenda item three is apologies. Can I ask members if they're aware of any apologies? Clark? None. None. Okay. Agenda item four then, members, <coughs> excuse me, is chairperson's business. Can I remind members that the committee agreed to seek an informal briefing from the department on the minister's paper to the executive on period poverty? Officials have been unable to provide the briefing until the matter is considered by the executive as executive papers are confidential. Can I advise the committee that this issue is to come to the executive or scheduled to come to the executive on Thursday, the 17th of December, and officials will provide an informal briefing on Friday, the 18th of December. A short written note would be provided by the clerk after the informal briefing. And I seek uh, members' views on this and ask members um, to advise the clerk on their availability to attend the informal briefing. Members content with that adjusted approach? Agreed? Okay, can I also advise committee members that Pat Catney, MLA, has written to the committee regards his private members' bill relating to period product provision, and this is in tabled items. Can I seek members' agreement to respond to Pat to indicate the committee's support for free provision of period products in schools? Agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Thank you. Okay, members, uh, agenda item 4.2 is ministerial statements. Can I remind members that the minister made a statement on the terms of reference for the independent review of education and on examination contingencies for 2021, related papers and the revised terms of reference for the review from the minister are in your tabled papers. Can I advise members uh, that the deputy chairperson uh, met informally with the minister to discuss the above on Tuesday the 15th of December um, and advise members that the department and SEA are currently working on the details underpinning the announced exam contingencies including the COVID tariff and generous uh, grading which are to be um, extended from 2020 to 21 and could brief on these in the new years. Um, Clark, can I, can I just add to that, um, as I did yesterday, um, that the, I understand that business um, changed yesterday, uh, but the 10 minutes that we had to read both statements of such significance on exams and a fundamental review of education um, made uh, it extremely difficult to adequately scrutinise the content of those uh, announcements um, and hopefully that isn't uh, something that's going to happen too often. Um, I think on, the, on that ground it would be um, useful to request um, from the department clarity uh, and a briefing on the details underpinning the announcement in relation to exam contingencies, um, particularly as I've said in relation to what is meant by generous grading and what is meant by the COVID tariff. Um, what, how many marks the COVID tariff would be, how many days would be required to access the, the COVID tariff. I would also be eager to seek um, clarity with regards to why this approach has been taken with ASNA levels, um, but not GCSEs. Um, I'd also be keen to ask why this level of modification has not been extended for transfer tests as well. Um, but I'm happy to take members' uh, views in relation to that. Sorry, I should add as well another proposed action. Clark, I think we should invite the, the Minister to attend the Education Committee meeting on January the 13th as well to provide some update in relation to those details. Members wish to comment on that particular item? Chair? Yes, Robbie. 
Thank you, Chair. I think you've covered just uh, most of it there. And, and I mean, let's, let's be fair to the Minister, the, the, the announcement on the A-levels and this was, was, was more than welcome. But I know that I have a few queries from last night and this morning with regard to teachers also looking clarity in and around the omissions piece. So it's the detail in and around how that's going to be in terms of the choice for the assessments. So I've had, a, <clears throat> I've just given what I think is a best stab at that. So the, we, the, the teachers really need that level of detail as soon as possible, um, preferably before Christmas. Hopefully the, the Minister and the Department are already on that, but I think that piece in the round, um, what the methodology is for the, the assessments and the omission, because um, obviously the curriculum has to be taught in its entirety. So, so some clarity in around that, please. Okay, uh, obviously this is our last meeting prior to Christmas, Robbie, and our first formal committee, committee meeting is the 13th of January, which is why I'm suggesting we invite the Minister to that meeting, given as you've alluded to, the extent of follow-up questions that have arisen from those statements. Any other members wish to come in before we seek agreement on actions? Well, just, just think, Chair, um, I agree with everything you've said, but you know, should we be asking, has the full quality impact assessment been carried out? Happy to add that to the correspondence, Daniel. I think it's important, given the situation and the reports that I am receiving from schools, I'm sure others the same. Okay. Any other members for ask the clerk to summarise our actions? No. Nope. Okay. Clark, content to summarise those actions? So, Chairperson, <coughs> excuse me, writing to the department seeking clarity on a briefing from the Minister on the 13th of uh, January on the details underpinning the exam contingencies, including in particular the COVID tariff for days and how many marks, etc. Um, also, seeking clarity as to why this approach has not been adopted for GCSE, uh, picking up Mr. Butler's point on looking for detail on how the methodology of omissions is actually going to work. Uh, and then asking why a similar approach has not been adopted for transfer tests and then finally um, asking um, whether uh, an EQIA has been carried out on the proposed um, contingency changes. If that is okay. okay, members agreed? Agreed? I need, I need the audit agreed every now and again or the clerk doesn't let me go on. <laughs> agreed, Chair. Excellent, thank you. Well, okay. Uh, agenda item 4.3 then is licensing and registration of clubs amendment bill. Can I advise members that the committee considered correspondence from the Communities Committee in respect of the licensing and registration of clubs amendment bill? The bill, if passed, would allow school formals, etc., to be held in unlicensed parts of licensed premises after 9.30 p.m. Can I seek the committee's agreement to write to NAHT and ASCL and suggest that these groups which represent school pr principals may wish to reply to the committee stage of the bill given what it, it pertains to and perhaps call for the provision of clear guidance for schools on these matters. Agreed? Agreed, thank you. Thank you. 4.4 <clears throat> members. Uh, in relation to FOI request during recess, can I inform members that during recess it is practice to delegate authority to the chairperson and deputy chairperson to consider any non-routine, non-contentious FOI requests. Can I advise members if any such requests are received, the views expressed by the chairperson and or the deputy chairperson and the response issued will be considered at the first meeting following the recess period. I can ask members if they are content to delegate authority to consider any such requests to the chairperson and deputy chairperson during recess period. Agreed? Agreed. Thank you. Agreed. Thank you. Okay, members, draft minutes. Can I refer members to draft minutes of the committee meeting of the 9th of December at page 146 and seek members' agreement that they are a complete and accurate record of proceedings. Agreed? Members. Agreed. Agreed. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, members, there are no matters arising. And as said earlier, agenda item seven has been uh, rescheduled. Okay, members, agenda item eight, uh, the oral briefing from the Department of Education on the revised children and young people's strategy. Can I ask Assembly Broadcasting to remove all members from the spotlight and to add our witnesses? Can I refer members to a briefing note from the committee clerk at page 166 
tables, briefing papers, and correspondence from the department. Reese, no. Sorry, sorry, Chairperson. I don't know if they're there. Can you see? Um, there is a room. <laughs> is there anybody sitting? <laughs> We're all badly failed. <laughs> we are unusually ahead of schedule, Clark, I believe. <laughs> no, there's nobody there, perhaps, Chair. No, okay. We'll move on to correspondence. Sorry about that, members. Okay. The we'll return to agenda item eight shortly, members, and in the meantime, uh, move to agenda item nine correspondence. Can I ask the clerk to speak to correspondence? Caught me now, Chair. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I can I can refer members to page four eight five, where we have fourteen items of correspondence, and a summary note included at page four eight five to four eight seven, and I'll ask the clerk to speak to the summary note at page four eight five, with a few exceptions, and I'm a clerk. I might. Uh, speak to a few items myself here as well. So, Chairperson, just uh, asking the committee if they're content to dispose of the correspondence as per the covering note and uh, as per the exceptions, with, with the following exceptions. So, just to pick out a couple. Excuse me. <coughs> Sorry. Hold on. No problem. Here we go. At uh, page 488, this is a response from the Education Authority on the One Project, which is an integrated procurement, finance, recruitment, HR and payroll solution for schools and other EA users. It also includes a replacement of the teacher's payroll system for the department. There have been delays and a project reset. All elements of the project are to be complete by March 2022. Um, EA declined to disclose the overall costs, but in AQW's DE advised that um, 17.1 million has been paid to date to the delivery agent, which appears to be Fujitsu. Um, and Deloitte also appeared to be subcontractors to that project. So, Chair, just to ask if the committee are content to arrange an oral briefing on that uh, subject uh, sometime in the new year, given that just the size of it. Members agreed? Agreed. 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 Uh, then, at uh, page 509, this is a response from the Education Authority on the use of single use plastics in schools. Um, EA indicates that its guidance encourages parents to make sustainable choices for their children. Um, can I ask Chairperson if the committee are content just to forward this to the organisation that raised the issue some time ago, um, which was uh, Heat Boss? Members mm -hmm. agreed. Yeah, uh, and if there's any further correspondence, um, we can consider that in due course then, yeah. Uh, indeed, Chairperson. And just, the word, just to point out to members, I think the previous one and that one had been with the Education Authority had answered at the end of September, but they didn't get through the department until now. Okay. Um, so, what happened? Well, anyway, there you go. Just to point that out to members. Okay. Um, moving on then to page 515. Excuse me. <coughs> this is a response from the Minister indicating that neither the DE nor the General Teaching Council in Northern Ireland has the legal virus to investigate or sanction teachers accused of misconduct. Uh, the Minister has indicated that legislation may be brought forward by the summer of 2021 and assures the committee that there are other means by which teachers guilty of very serious misconduct can be barred from teaching in schools. Um, I can ask Chair if the members are content to note. Content to note. I'm not sure, Chair. Daniel, I'm yeah. Not sure. yeah. I'm not sure. I appreciate the correspondence from the Minister, but I'm not sure entirely correct in all instances. Um, maybe could I suggest that the committee seek. Uh, the Minister's reassurance uh, that the measures he has in place are comprehensive enough to cover all eventuality. Yeah, can, can I can I propose we seek a, a briefing from the Department of Education on the, the current operation of the GTCNI? It would be an interesting presentation. Be content, oh, members yes. content with that? Agreed? Sorry, I couldn't actually hear what Mr. McCrossan said, so we're um, uh, just seeking an oral briefing as the action, Chair? Yeah, uh, that's what I'm proposing. Are members content with that, Daniel? Yes, well, I'm content. I'm just saying it would be an interesting briefing. Okay. <laughs> okay, thanks. Uh, so at page 522 is a copy of a letter to the Executive Office from the Chairpersons of the Committees for the Economy, TEO, Health and um, Communities. This is around student health and well-being during the pandemic and asking for a coordinated approach uh, from, from the executive. Uh, can I ask members if they are content to write to DE asking if it is to support coordinated action given its role in respect of the Children's Services Cooperation Act and the Children and Young People Strategy, which we're about to hear about? Agreed. 
Chair, can I just, just Robin, uh, yeah. ask, ask on, on this one, uh, and it's probably outside the remit of this committee, but obviously there, you know, right across the UK, there is a concern about student mental health in these cir current circumstances. Um, maybe it would be, Chair, I mean, the, the, the students we're talking about are the Department of the Economy the students. Um, but indeed, whether or not there would be some merit in this committee gaining an understanding of what the issues really are around student mental health, um, uh, and certainly for the, the you know, for, for, for uh, as they come up to A level and, uh, and then transfer into, uh, would that be appropriate, Chair, that, uh, or, or how might that be achieved? I think we could write to the economy committee and just they've obviously taken evidence just ask them to share the, the relevant evidence um that, 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 that then when they come back to us we could take that forward in my own mind chair i had more the sort of the health professionals who would be rather than just the evidence uh, that was presented to the economy is it is, is it worth considering taking a, a briefing from the mental health champion who in, in relation to this or is it do you have more substantive evidence in mind, Robin? Yeah, uh, members. No, sir, certainly at this stage, chair, sure, the mental health champion might be, might be the appropriate one, and then after which you could decide whether you needed. Okay. But, you know, it just seems to be such a topical subject yeah. right across the whole of the UK. Um, okay. And to ignore it, I think would be remiss of us. Mm. If we yeah, if we <coughs> could uh, forward work program a, a session in relation to. Uh, another session, we've obviously had a, a, a few already, Clark, but a, a session in relation to um, pupil and student mental health and invite the mental health champion to such a session, Robin? Yes? Certainly a first step, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, okay, Clark. Agreed. 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 <coughs> Sorry, again. Uh, and chair, then... chair, before you, chair, before you move on, someone's got their <clears throat> mic unmuted and it, I was... It was a wee bit hard to follow what was going on in that last session there. Okay. Can you just get members to check online there? I, I'll mute mine now again. Okay, yeah, if members want to mute. Uh, Robbie, do you want us to summarise that action for you quickly, or are you content? Yeah, I think I've got the last piece about maybe uh, bringing in the mental health champion, is that correct? That's correct, yeah. Yeah, no, that's, that's fine. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Thanks, Clark. Okay, at page 524 is correspondence from the Reverse the Trend Foundation, providing information on a multi-agency approach to a rollout of a 12-week COVID-19 curriculum recovery, restart and resilience programme um, for uh, children and young people in Northern Ireland. Uh, they, they contacted me by phone, they sent me that email. I asked them to send me a bit more and I haven't, so um, can I ask Chairperson if the committee are content to write to the department and ask for more information um, about this? Agreed. 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 And then, <coughs> sorry, uh, moving on to tabled items. If uh, members Clark, are could up. I maybe just come in on a couple, couple of the, the items of correspondence there? Um, so at page 526, um, item 9.8 it is, members, uh, on page uh, 526, <coughs> a copy of a letter from uh, a school to the minister asking for guidance on uh, track and tracing. Uh, it reads, wish to inquire if a child or staff member who was in school on the 18th of December subsequently tests positive for COVID-19, who will be uh, expected to provide uh, to the contact tracing information to the public health agency and send out letters to close contacts. In the above mentioned scenario, I, uh, school leaders will be on annual leave. And therefore, uh, do not think it unreasonable that the minister has a contingency in place for this work being completed and um, we'd like to ask what this plan is. Uh, to clarify, this is not necessarily a straightforward process and on previous occasions has required uh, a day to complete. Um, this is also a task difficult to complete without being in the school building. Uh, Clark, have we written to the Education Minister seeking clarification regards contact tracing during the Christmas break already? Yeah, we have, and if you look haven't at received the correspondence, have we, we have in tabled okay. items at the very, very end. Um, okay. They have come back uh, with answers to those questions. What page is that? It would just through the very last uh, page of tabled items. Okay. Which hopefully, you've oh. got. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So we just got that at about um, ten to nine this morning. Okay. Just reviewing that quickly, Clark. Okay. 
Okay, so you can correct me if I'm wrong, Clark, but the correspondence says that um, BHA dedicated education tracing team will remain operational until 4 p.m. on Wednesday, the 23rd of December. After this date, any cases identified will be managed through the PHA's routine contact tracing service. Um, However, there may be a limited number of cases notified to schools during the Christmas holiday period when the PHA may need to make contact with schools to identify close contacts. There is no further additional support specifically provided to schools for track and trace other than the dedicated helpline mentioned previously. Um, so is that the, the department table? is involved. Yeah, table yeah. items. Pa one, table papers. Table papers. Yeah, one 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 five one one four one one five. Um, okay, the department is involved in all going engagement with PHA to smooth procedures and automate information. But schools, as with workplaces and hospitality venues, are a fundament, fundamental element of the test and trace system. Do we, um, do we, do we know if the department has communicated that to schools? We just got that this morning, so... Um, I okay. Um, members be content, not sure how we would get a response at this stage, Clark, um, given how close it is to the uh, time period, but members content to write to the department and minister to ask if the correspondence that we've received here um, this morning has been communicated with school leaders as I've received a well, good. considerable amount of inquiry from school leaders asking how contact tracing will work over um, the Christmas break and indeed as the committee has also done via this correspondence here um, which um, was received. When was that correspondence received, Clark? Do you know? That uh, one we just. Worked. Sorry, the one uh, item nine point eight, page five two six. That's a good question. Okay. Well, it, it's it's uh, typical of the inquiries I'm receiving from school leaders asking what the arrangements will be over the Christmas break, um, and it's it, it seems to me that that is saying that. Um, Schools. Chair, I, I, asked this, I have to address this, Chair. I, I asked the Minister directly this last Thursday or last uh, Wednesday at committee, and he didn't ask this. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm reacting live here, members, to table items, table correspondence we've received from the department at, at nine o'clock this morning, Clark. Yeah, um, with regards to uh, school uh, contact tracing during um, the Christmas closure. Um, it, it, it says, there may be a limited number of cases notified to schools during the Christmas holiday period when the PHA may need to make contact with schools to identify close contacts. I'm unaware of that being communicated to schools and I'm unaware of um, what, what, what the exact nature of that process would be if if, if people would, are not in school buildings, William? It depends what it says on the correspondence that the Minister sent to the schools on the 8th of December, I suppose. Maybe included in that. Yeah, I don't, I don't think it included any, th any more detail than, right. than, well, than what we what, what might be an idea if we we're trying to elicit a response quickly is perhaps at the very start of the session with the officials from the department, if we ask that question, perhaps they might be able to respond or get clarification for us. Well, I'll email the Dalo now, yeah. actually, and we may get an answer. Okay, so the question is, have school leaders yeah. been advised of the information that's in the yeah. correspondence we got at 45? Yep. And, not, and, 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 what, and, and further detail of exactly what that process is set to look like, because I'm not, I'm not sure school leaders have been notified that they, they, there may be a limited number of cases notified to them during the Christmas holiday period when PHA may need to make contact with them to identify close contacts. Um, I, I'm not sure that, 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 that those arrangements have been established with the school leaders or detailed the school leaders with, with what they are. That, that was the nature of your question as well, Justin, yeah? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so, Clark, in summary of the action, we're going to try and seek some urgent clarification in relation to that, yeah? Yes. Okay, while you're doing that, Clark, then, um, at item 9.9, at uh, page 527, 
um, of our PACs um, is in relation to concerns about um, A-level examinations. Hopefully some of those have been addressed in relation to the announcements. Um, and page then 533 is correspondence with regards to concerns on the transfer tests. That's item 9, uh, 9.1, page 533. Um, from a, a parent of a child in P7 due to sit AQE in November. Says we're now at a stage where school um, will not be teaching past the 11th of December, um, other than remote learning, I presume, and uncertainty over how January is now going to look. Um, what consideration has been given to alternative arrangements? Should children be isolating? How can special circumstances be met if tests are missed? If the school has no data from P6 as tests were not completed then also, are we forwarding that correspondence to the department for response, Clark? Um, we can do. Members, members can attempt to forward that correspondence. Agreed. Agreed. Okay, then agenda, uh, item 9.13 at page 635 uh, is from the uh, Children's Law Centre on post-primary transfer as well and the associated impact on rights. Um, just to summarise some of the correspondence from the Children's Law Centre members says children have the right to an effective and inclusive education regardless of their background or status and through its casework Children's Law Centre can see major adverse impacts uh, that ongoing educational disruption is having on young people from a wide range of backgrounds. In relation to transfer tests specifically, it reads that the use of academic selection as a mechanism to transfer 11-year-old children into secondary education breaches the UNCRC, United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child, and they note that the United Nations Committee on the Rights of the Child has repeatedly called for it to be discontinued, Articles 2, 3 and 29 of the UNCRC and Articles 7 and 24 of the UNCRPD are engaged in this regard. Further, for this year's transfer, there is a wealth of evidence of fear, worry, stress and concern about the potential inequalities that transfer testing in January 2021 will inevitably cause. You can see from our casework evidence that existing inequalities for these children have been magnified by the impacts of COVID-19. Um, as the duty bearer in respect of ensuring the children's right to education without discrimination, the Department of Education must ensure an alternative non-discriminatory transfer system is immediately engaged. We anticipate that in the absence of very firm, fair and clear leadership and direction from the Department about an alternative, non-discriminatory and reasonable transfer mechanism and criteria, there will be a proliferation of litigation arising from this year's transfer process, which will cause further anxiety and disruption to children and families. Members content to forward that correspondence for response from the Department also? Agreed. Agreed? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, Okay, Clark, also note item 9.14, page uh, 640, a copy of a report from Think Tank Pivotal on 14 to 19 education skills and training. Would it, I realise the forward work programme is highly scheduled already, but would members be content to receive a, a briefing from Pivotal um, on that 14 to 19 strategy report? Agreed. Yeah? Agreed? Agreed. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, Clark, um, you're free to come back in there on correspondence then, yeah? So, moving then to tabled items, members, and sorry there's so many of them, but um, it saves us having an absolute avalanche in January. So, the um, first table item, item 16, correspondence from the Minister to school principals indicating an enhanced programme of online autism training for teachers. Um, and the, as members are aware, the committee is to receive a briefing on this issue early in the new year. So, can I ask if members are content to note? Agreed. Agreed. Thank well you. Done. Thank you. Thanks, members. Um, and then we have at the next item in tabled is a response from SIA replying to concerns raised by schools and pupils in respective A levels. Um, it basically reiterates a lot of things that SIA have indicated before. So can I ask if uh, the committee are content to note and to forward the reply to the originators of the correspondence? 
I think what the situation page is that on? I don't know. What, no. Could you tell me what page that is in the table? Page pack? 485. Okay. Oh, sorry, the correspondence. It's the table pack? It's the table pack. It's in the yeah, table pack? Yeah. Four hundred and eighty-five pages in the table pack? Wow. Yeah, no. <laughs> I don't think it was that many. Uh, I'm back out of the table pack, sorry. Yeah, I'm not sure my table pack has updated in time to contain all of those uh, items, uh, Clark. I think it was up the agenda item. Where did I find that in? Eight. <laughs> mm, I don't know either. I don't know. It just... I think this is a subject that the um, committee has asked Sia about a few times. Okay. Um, so it may well be that we have a previous correspondence on it. Um, but there's certainly... Um, okay. Do members have this in tabled items? Because if we don't, then um, thank you. It's 61. 61 of tabled items. That's okay. Members it. Okay. Got it. And that came from I think it was one of the schools wrote to us, uh, asked a lot of very interesting, detailed questions, and um, the C has come back with some responses. So if members are intent to note and obviously to uh, forward it to the school that wrote to us. Okay. Agreed. Great. 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 Uh, after that, thank you. After that, um, there is correspondence from a school uh, referring to commentary at the committee on the 9th of December in respect of a COVID-19 outbreak. Uh, they just wanted that uh, information to be brought to the committee's attention um, to avoid any uh, confusion in that regard. So can I ask chairperson and members therefore content to note? Members content to note. Agreed. Great. Yep. You. Okay, thank you. And then at uh, the next item is correspondence from a concerned parent relating to the briefing that the committee took last week on restrictive practices in schools. I could just ask if members are content for the clerk to write again to DE and just seeking information on training for school staff on positive behaviour strategies in mainstream schools. I think the committee had asked about special schools, but you can ask for mainstream as well. Are content? Agreed. Agreed. Thank you. Agreed. Nearly there. Um, then we have uh, an extract from the Human Rights Commission annual statements. Uh, so the, the, the document itself is like 150 pages long, but I just took out the bits which were even vaguely education related. Uh, they cover a lot of stuff which um, members would be familiar with anyway. Just off the, if members are content to note. Agreed. Agreed. Lovely. And then um, we have correspondence from CCMS replying to committee correspondence around the FIDO exemption on the certificate in religious education. A CCMS indicate that they believe that the trustees of uh, Catholic schools should be able to retain the FIDO exemption and they're setting out their policy in respect of the certificate in religious education. Can I ask Chairperson if members are content to invite CCMS to come along and provide an oral briefing on this? Agreed. Agreed. Lovely. And Thank you. Okay, lovely. Um, then there's a couple more. Um, there's a copy of correspondence to the minister from a concerned parent, read the transfer test. Uh, and if I could ask uh, members if they are content to note. Agreed. Okay, thanks. And uh, then we have, after that, correspondence from a concerned teacher, uh, re-vaccinations. Um, now the committee made the point and actually wrote to the department last week indicating that they felt that teachers and education professionals should be high on the list for um, early vaccination, given the, you know, the chances of exposure. So that being the case, are members content to note? Nope. Agreed. Lovely. And then, correspondence from the Committee for Justice. This is re sexual exploitation of children and DE's role, um, uh, and the role that DE has in advising and uh, educating young people on the criminal law in relation to sexual offences, including the age of consent for sexual relations. So uh, Committee for Justice is writing to um, the, the Minister and has, has copied us in. Uh, the Committee will, I think, discuss some of these issues in its informal meeting on the 12th of January on relationship and sexuality education. So there's an informal meeting with uh, a youth group uh, at Belfast City Council, so um, we may return to these issues uh, then. So if members are in the meantime content to note? Yeah, would it, would it be appropriate to write to the department just to seek correspondence in relation to to its role? Well, we can ask us to copy us in the answer in the reply. Yeah, yep. yeah that'd be great. Lovely. Members yeah. agreed? Yeah, just, just one thing. Yeah. Is that Belfast City Council's Youth Forum? That, yes, I think so. It? Okay. So it, it's an informal meeting that we have scheduled for 9.30 on Tuesday 12th of January, I think, and they've done a bit of work on relationship and sexuality education. I want to talk about their survey. And, and the, are these officers from the Youth Forum or young people? It's the young people um, with officers. Okay, thank you. I can get you. more details for you on that, um, William. I know that Sia 
has done work in relation to RSE as well. That, That's right, there's a new hub. Yeah, that maybe we'd seek a briefing on in the uh, future as well. I imagine the young people will comment on that. And then yep. the final item of correspondence, which the committee has just dealt with, is from the department on um, track and tracing um, over Christmas holidays, um, etc., which the committee has just um, dealt with. So we're, uh, I've just contacted the uh, DALO, and they will hopefully come back to this before the end of the meeting to confirm school leaders have been told um, that details have been provided or otherwise. So that being the case, are committee then content with correspondence? Yep. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Um, we ready for our admin session then? I think we should be. Yeah. So if we go back to item eight. Okay, members. Agenda item eight is our Department of Education oral briefing on the revised children and young people's strategy. Can I ask Assembly Broadcasting to remove all members from the spotlight and to add our witnesses? Uh, refer members again to a briefing note from the committee clerk at page 166, table briefing papers and correspondence from the department, recent <coughs> relevant correspondence from the department at page 362, a slightly revised version of the strategy has been circulated to members by email. How many revised versions are there, clerk? Well, it's been through the executive's <laughs> one. Okay, all right. Tell you. Um, and can I welcome Paul Brush, Director, Youth and Early Years, Department of Education, June Wilkinson, Head of Children and Young People's Strategy Team at the Department of Education and Drina Evans, Children's and Young People's <laughs> Strategy Team, Department of Education. Can I advise officials that uh, witness and the witnesses and um, we give them 15 minutes to make an opening statement followed by questions from the members. Oh, I think we're starting with Paul then. Yes, thank you, thank Chair, you. and good morning, everyone. Uh, just want to thank you for the opportunity to give you an update on the Children and Young People Strategy. Um, as you've said, I'm Paul Brush, the director of the team that deals with this. June Wilkinson, to my right, um, has been with the development of the strategy for a, a number of years, and Drina Evans within the team also very much involved in the process to date. I would like to thank the committee at the outset for your agreement in October um, that the strategy could progress to the executive even though you didn't have a chance to have this oral session. Um, it has really meant that we've been able to make progress and we're at a point now where we're really ready to begin on the implementation phase. So um, that has been very much welcomed. Just to quickly recap on the background to the strategy because it has been a number of years in the making. Um, the previous 10-year executive children and young people strategy was due to conclude in 2016 and work had been underway since September 2015 to develop um, a successor strategy. Around the same time, you will know that the Children's Services Cooperation Bill was going through the Assembly with the intention of placing a legal requirement on the executive to adopt a strategy to improve the well-being of children and young people. And the bill became law in December 2015. So that created a legal requirement for a new strategy to be developed. The Department of Education took the lead on developing that new strategy, but important to stress on behalf of the executive as a whole, following the reorganization of departments in 2016, it is important to stress it is very much an executive strategy and all departments have been involved in its development. Following extensive co-design, and I think we can, we can give you a lot of detail on this if you're interested in it, on the number and the range of groups and individuals who've been involved in this process, um, statutory, voluntary and community organisations, parents, guardians, carers, children and young people themselves. The involvement of all those uh, resulted in a draft strategy initially going to cover the period 2017 to 2027, was approved by the executive and issued for public consultation. The consultation ran from December 2016 to March 2017. 
and the intention had been that the strategy would really be ratified and come into being in early 2017, but for the obvious reasons that didn't take place. Then uh, work continued in the background from 2017 to 2019, further engagement, further discussion with departments. Um, and although we were unable to publish the executive strategy, we did what we could to uh, progress the duty of cooperation in the, in the Act through that period. And we can certainly give some examples of cooperation that has already taken place um, even in advance of the strategy coming into being. Um, in March 2017, we published an analysis report on the responses to the consultation, and this was used to inform the development of a cross-departmental children and young people strategy, which was then published uh, in December 2019. Um, now, obviously, that was before the executive was restored, and the intention in publishing it was to set out a framework for progressing children's issues until the executive returned to adopt its own strategy. We also, import, important to say, we published interim guidance on the Children's Services Cooperation Act in November 2018. And the intention of this was to help children author children's authorities to better understand their cooperation duties under the Act, and I suppose to elaborate on what good cooperation would look like. Um, uh, and that was published, as I say, in 2018, but very much in interim form, uh, with the intention of updating and formalising it once a strategy had emerged. We are now at the point where an executive children and young people strategy has been prepared and was approved by the executive last Thursday. There are some minor changes to the text of the document, uh, from the one that you would have received in September. Nothing terribly significant, but we can go into those if you wish to do so. The easy read version, which you've also received, um, hasn't changed from, from the one you've seen in September. So just a few points to highlight uh, regarding the strategy itself. As I said early, earlier, it's not a Department of Education strategy, it's an executive one. Uh, a project board was established to uh, bring it to this stage. On that board, there was representation from the Departments of Education, Health, Justice, Communities and Economy, as well as from the Office of the Northern Ireland Commissioner for Children and Young People. And I would just like to... Um, pay tribute to the contribution of the Commissioner throughout this process. And, uh, and obviously, well, she will have an ongoing interest as we move into the implementation phase. We've also had tremendous help and support from a number of public sector organisations, professional bodies, voluntary and community sector, and lots of expert groups. Worth saying, the strategy does not attempt to cover everything that the public sector does for children and young people. It focuses on the things that the stakeholders told us are the most important issues in the lives of children today. Things where by taking action, we can make a difference. Hence the areas of greatest focus, and there are a lot of them, but they're absolutely not intended to be completely comprehensive, so there could be a few areas um, that, that you might consider should be in there that aren't in there. But of course, when we get to the implementation phase, that's where a lot of the detail will be picked up. The strategy is very much in alignment with the approach taken by the Programme for Government. We've attempted to, to remain in step with developments um, on the PFG and, and, and indeed the outcomes and that many of the population indicators that the strategy will use will mirror and reflect those that uh, have been in and hopefully will be in the next iteration of the programme for government. Um, the key elements of the new strategy are mostly unchanged from that draft that was produced back in 2016. We have the same eight outcomes that uh, they have proved to be the correct ones, even through the, the further um, engagement and consultation. 
we have 40 areas of greatest focus. Um, they're not listed in any order or priority, um, but we have departments' greatest effort, but, but are where departments' greatest efforts will be focused um, and in, in those first few years. The areas of greatest focus are discussed under the outcome to which they link most strongly, but obviously they can impact on several outcomes. So it's not a, a just a, a simple linear relationship. They have been grouped in a way that I suppose indicates where the strongest impact is likely to be, but there are interconnections right across the piece. The original areas of greatest focus have been gained, and a few new ones have been added. Um, nurturing children with social, emotional, and behavioural difficulties has, um, has been added. Bullying has been added since the previous version. Um, children and young people who are victims or at risk of sexual exploitation has been added. Improving children and young people's access to the natural environment and the quality of the environments in which they live, learn and play is also new. Improving communication with children and young people who have a learning difficulty, autism or communication barrier. This came from the JAM card, um, the Just a Minute initiative, which aims to make things better for people with communication difficulties by asking people to give them a bit more time in customer service interactions. And finally, promoting diversity and mutual understanding has also come in. The strategy's values and principles have also been slightly amended to include two new ones. The objective, one of the values and principles now included is that the strategy be transparent and open to scrutiny. And I think um, if we get into discussion on the implementation phase, uh, that will be particularly um, a guiding principle at, at that stage and child-centred and family-focused. And I think the family focus point's worth um, underscoring because it's recognised that children don't live in isolation. Um, any advice and support must take parents and other family members into account, and that has come in as well. The strategy also takes account of developments since 2017. For example, references to adverse childhood experiences. Um, a lot of research has emerged in the intervening years on that and the strategy reflects some of that. There's also um, further input on um, cyberbullying and the Im implications of the internet that have um, come even more to the fore in the last couple, couple of years. And in this past nine months, we've uh, updated the strategy to take account of the COVID-19 situation. It hasn't resulted in any new um, areas of greatest focus or, or actual actions or priorities. Uh, it's more around the context and indeed, if anything, has made the need for some of the areas of focus all the more stark, um, but it actually hasn't added anything. So it was just to give you a sense of where what the next steps are as we see them. Um, as I say, the executive has now agreed the strategy. Uh, the next thing will be to lay it in the assembly um, and then begin the, begin the development of the monitoring, reporting and participation structures. And we can talk a bit about our thinking in, in that regard um, if you wish to do so. We also want to finalise the small suite of high-level population indicators and that will be used really to monitor what impact the strategy is having at the outcome level. And this is really in line with the whole ethos um, of outcome reporting uh, within the programme for government. Um, we then need to, to produce a, an implementation plan or a delivery plan which will cover the first three years uh, of the strategy's life. It will set out actions which departments will take in that initial period um, to, cover, to achieve the eight outcomes. So this is where a lot of the detail will begin to emerge. And as I say, that's a job now. We've already started it. We've got a lot of the input from departments 
there's a process of refining and further challenge to be gone through, but the objective would be to have a draft of that um, within the first quarter of 2021. So that's the, the plan. Uh, as I say, really, the, the work begins in earnest as we start to move from the very high-level strategy to the delivery and implementation commitments by departments and others. And cooperation, I suppose, <coughs> runs throughout the heart of it. And that implementation delivery plan will need to drive cooperation. And you know, we've, we're having some thoughts on how we can, I suppose, differentiate it from some of the traditional delivery and implementation plans, which are a list of what each individual department is going to do, to turn it into a driver for that sort of interdepartmental cooperation that is going to be so essential if the outcomes are to be achieved, to potentially even identify a few areas that the spotlight should be on, um, particularly regarding the necessary cooperation to crack some um, particularly difficult issues. And as always, um, would welcome the thoughts and views of the committee on anything in particular that they would like to see focused on within that um, delivery plan. And finally, just to say that we, we see this strategy as the programme for government for children and young people. It's at that level. It's essential that all the strategies that sit beneath it that are being developed right across the executive, not only children's focus strategies, all strategies, um, consider the, their implications for children and young people and this strategy provides the framework for them to do so. And to some extent, we, will, we would be hoping that the committee would even consider things that are coming before it and considering it in the light of the children and young people strategy and asking the question increasingly, how does this fit with the commitments and the objectives within the CYPS so that we try and ensure that it becomes embedded in everything that we do right across not only this department but the executive. So happy to take questions uh, and, and elaborate further as required. Thanks for that, Paul, and happy to facilitate questions for you. Um, that's that's obviously a, a, a briefing centering around to the most part how we how we have got to where we have got. It would be interesting. Um, at a future date if we could maybe set up a, a formal or informal session where you the, the department actually takes us through the nuts and bolts and the substance of the strategy as well um i think children and young people would like to to hear about the the detail of that um however the children and young people strategy um indicates that departments will have regard for the uncrc united Nations convention on the rights of the child in their policies planning and service delivery. Can you say a bit about what that means and whether all executive departments are now required to ensure that their policies, planning and service delivery are compliant with the UNCRC? Yeah, um, the Children Services Corporation Act, um, really, this is where, I suppose, we're tying it back to that the, the Act requires that um, children's, children's authorities um, give recognition to the definition of well-being in the UNCRC and in their uh, efforts to, um, I suppose, promote the well-being of children and young people. And taking that into the strategy, um, we have, I suppose, embedded the principles, a lot of the terminology, a lot of the aspirations of the UNCRC within the strategy. It has a section on rights and the, the strategy is very clearly rights based. Um, if, if you're saying is the UNCRC um, a legal requirement for all departments to apply um, wholesale, then no, that would be an executive decision uh, to ratify it in its own right. But the essence of the UNCRC 
um, is embedded within the strategy and to a large extent the strategy is the delivery plan um, that the UNCRC would require if it were to be ratified by, by the executive and indeed where it has been in, in other places like Scotland. So the fact that the strategy has now been agreed by the executive um, and effectively signed up to Everything in there on the URC, UNCRC has been signed up to by the executive. So I think it provides a good basis on which to proceed. Are there any plans for the executive to ratify the UNCRC? I, I'm not aware of, of that being on the agenda, Chair. Okay. Um, obviously, that, that will be something that would need to be brought separately. Okay. And uh, Drina, sorry, sorry, can sorry, I bring in Drina? She's a. Uh, can I just say that? The UNCRC is a ratified by the U by the UK government, so therefore all the governments all of the UK are signed up to it by virtue of that. Um, it's really how it's implemented and taken forward within each administration. Uh, in this case, we're hoping in the case of the strategy, what we've tried to do is take what ex is what exists and build it into what will be the major children's strategy going forward. Um, for example, the each outcome is linked to the relevant UNCRC articles. Uh, there's actually one of the actions going forward is to improve knowledge and awareness of the UNCRC, not just among government departments, but also among well, even parents and children, many of whom are not aware of it. Um, it's, it's really a work in progress as a strategy goes forward then awareness of the UNCRC and consideration of it will be built in. Okay. And will all departments be making additional special arrangements to ensure that the voice of the child is included in policy development as a result of this strategy? Well, we, we, we have another project that is progressing in parallel um, called the Children and Young People's Participation in Decision Making Project. And it has all the children's champions from departments involved, specifically looking at how we mainstream uh, uh, the voice and input of children and young people in policy making right across the board. Um, I think it would be fair to say it's not as coordinated and perhaps as intentional as it needs to be, and indeed. In some cases, there just isn't the support for departments to know how to do it. Um, and a few experts in terms of the Youth Forum and the Education Authorities, Youth um, Support Services, facilitate those departments that come to them. But there is a separate project, Chair, looking at how this can be a much more, I suppose, holistic um, approach. Um, and we certainly would be happy to bring the um, emerging findings from that project to the committee in due course. Okay, last question from me. This strategy sets out eight strategic outcomes uh, to achieve uh, for all children and young people in Northern Ireland, and they're uh, based on um, eight areas listed in the Children's Services Cooperation Act. Outcome eight is that children and young people live in a society in which equality of opportunity and good relations are promoted. Could you speak to some key actions in the strategy that are, are going to deliver that key outcome? June, can I ask you to? Have we got the implement any of the implementation? Yeah. I guess, Chair, we're at the stage of just gathering the actions from departments. It's very much draft. We, I'm asking colleagues here if they can turn up the draft that we've received from them, um, from those areas. It's a work in progress. Okay. Um, I'm not sure if we will be able to give you much okay. detail on that today, but okay. I suppose we know that we will be coming back to you with the implementation plan, which will have all of that. But we can get into a bit more input? detail then, no problem. That's okay. Yeah. Okay, I was, I was about to say, I mean, um, examples like TBUC, um, like the Struhl um, New Campus Initiative, um, would be two that, examples that come to mind straight away, but I think um, this is worth further exploration, so it would be worth coming back to you on that issue. Okay, um, no problem. 
Yeah, there, there will actually be a lot more detail in the delivery plan. For example, all the tackling paramilitarism programs I know are in the so the delivery information plan. that we've got. Uh, the sorry, the delivery plan. Yeah. <laughs> so there will be a lot more detail, and we we really would like to take up your offer of informal discussions on that as it's developed, even before we produce a final consultation document to get your views on that. Uh, we've met with the Community Relations Council in developing that actual section yeah. 8, so we got a lot of information from them, uh, a lot of ideas which are for the detailed part of the implementation which we'd like to put into it, and um, we really would like to speak to you when we get to that stage. Okay, thank you. Can I bring in Robin Newton, MLA? Uh, thank you, Chair, and I welcome the publication of the document. And the Chair's final question may well have um, uh, take, take, taken away from, from my need to ask this question, but that, being a politician, will never stop me asking it anyway. <laughs> can, I, can I just ask, uh, it does, uh, does surprise me that at this stage there are as I can ascertain it, there are no measurements uh, within the, the document on how you are going to measure your success. I mean, if I refer to your page 27, our page 224, your page 40, and our page 237, and your page 99, and our page 296, they, they are pretty open-ended uh, uh, objectives without any specific measurement in, in how you would uh, determine the, the success. And indeed, all I should, I should thank the members for, for coming uh, to us this morning. You had mentioned a small suite of outcome monitoring are those within the document? Uh, I just can't find them. No, they're not in the document as it stands. Yeah, they were specifically removed um, following the consultation, and they um, exist, or they will exist in a standalone document. Um, there are twenty. The strategy is outcome-based in design, um, so it has eight outcomes. Um, there are twenty-nine population indicators that will measure the effectiveness of the outcomes as we go along. Um, the indicators document will provide the baseline of where we are now um, with those um, population indicators. Um, and as we move forward, um, the ongoing measurement will give us an indication of whether we have improved and whether the curve is being turned in different areas or um, during the monitoring, if remedial action needs to be taken within an action, to address um, its effectiveness um, and move it in the right direction. So again, we can bring those um, set of indicators to yourselves um, if the decision was just taken after the first consultation to remove them from the document. But they are part of a suite of documents for the strategy along with the forthcoming delivery plan. Okay. Is that not a bit unusual? Um, I I think it's you either criticise the executive, but I think you either have a strategy that goes into a sort of into actual delivery mode and has all of the detail, or you separate them out. Like it's not as though there will be a big gap between <coughs> these different stages. Um, as June says, the twenty-one indicators were consulted on, so they were out in the public domain as to okay. here are the sorts of things we think this strategy should um, essentially be judged on. Um, there's been further discussion around those. Some people said some of the 21 maybe weren't the best and there were others that weren't in there. There are areas even that we would like to be able to measure that we don't even have data for. Um, you know, one of those might be um, non-academic achievement in schools. Um, a lot of children and young people in the consultation felt that um, the totality of their achievement um, was often reduced to um, their examination success and could something in addition not be incorporated into how we are actually supporting children and young people to be um, good human beings. So where we have 
uh, in parallel a data development um, strand of work, looking at some of those areas that a strategy that's as wide ranging and ambitious, ambitious as this might actually need to prompt and promote new sources of data in some areas. So we wouldn't even have been in the position of giving the comprehensive list at the point at which we were developing some of our aspirations. It, it may actually follow the aspiration, but we certainly can bring our thinking um, on those um, indicators alongside the delivery plan. And of course, the delivery plan will have separate measures. So there's almost this 20 or whatever it ends up being set of population indicators, really top level things like, um, I'm just looking at one here, you know, the percentage of um, primary school children who are obese, you know, those sorts of big macro levels. Um, and then the delivery plan will have actual measurement against the things that it is proposing to do within the first three years. Okay, C could you, if I can refer you to your page, uh, your page 40 and our page 237, it's headed up children and young people living in areas of deprivation. And you, you're obviously looking at the health issue there and the various others. What might a measurement on that look like with your outcomes? Can you quote the section? I'm not sure what you've yeah. Just give us the section again. It's well, your, your page 40. Page 40 of your document. Um, of the strategy document? Yes. Yeah. And I think the indicator for that one would be the percentage of children living in absolute and relative poverty before housing costs. Um, and that's one of, I think that's one of the, the uh, areas of greatest focus where there is really only the one indicator. In this instance, a lot of it will be more the actions that departments are taking. Uh, we'll, we'll be asking the departments to give us the actions, set a date, and report against those actions. Yeah. So it will be a combination of the population indicators and the action uh, performance accountability. Yeah, and as you know yourself, that leads us into the, the child poverty strategy, which is led by Department for Communities, but again, is an executive strategy. So that goes into the detail um, and the measurement of performance there as to be what has been achieved within that strategy. And as you know yourself, then the Department for Communities is looking again at developing either a further children child poverty strategy or a wider poverty strategy. Um, so again, those are the strategic actions that will be bringing this forward. Okay, so I presume uh, you've uh, referred to the Department for Communities, then presumably the, the measurements that they yeah. import into their documents are yeah. informing yes. your document and, and yes. right, right across the... Yes, that's right. They contributed this in indicator to this piece of work okay. because they lead on, on that aspect um, that we're that particularly talking about. So they contributed that indicator and then their more, de more detailed measurements of their performance right across the departments to achieve that is where the, the ongoing measurement will be seen. And when the, when the minister um, circulated the draft to executive colleagues, one of the questions that came back was just seeking confirmation that the strategy could and would um, commit to picking up those indicators in any future um, poverty Obviously. strategy and the Minister gave a commitment that it, it absolutely would. It's, it's to be dynamic as new strategies or delivery uh, mechanisms emerge even a year, two years, three years out. The things that they are going to monitor and report on almost be adopt, get adopted into any delivery plan that we have. Okay, thank you, Chair. Thank you, members. Thanks, Rob. Uh, can I call uh, Nicola Brogan, please? Thank you, Chair, and thank the three of you for coming in and providing that update today. Um, it's always very useful to hear that there. Um, I just have a couple of questions. The first one, in the context of COVID and the impact that that has had on our children and young people this year, um, can officials advise on the resilience of this strategy? Um, can the strategy cater to the needs of children and young people in the aftermath of what has been an unprecedented and often traumatic year? 
Yes, well, as I say, this, we, we used the summer um, to look, take a, a fresh look at the strategy and went out to all departments to say, in the light of what has now hit us, um, what needs to be changed, um, we actually, in, well, again, had engagement with children and young people. I'll maybe ask June to give a wee bit of explanation as to how that input from children and young people and how they were experiencing um, the isolation of, of COVID um, has impacted in some of the narrative that we've changed, but hasn't actually needed to change some of the significant um, outputs and targets. June, would you give a wee bit of how we've tried to build in COVID? Yeah, certainly. Um, as you know, two, two of the main outcomes are um, health, uh, mental and physical health, and learning and achieving. So those, are, those outcomes remain the same, uh, regardless of, of what um, particular aspect of our lives has been affected. Um, but what I can say is that children and young people were invited and very much took part in the educational restart program as it was developed through the summer. Um, there were uh, a wide number of uh, children involved um, and they gave their views on the different aspects of the restart. The program then took those um, comments into account so that we could make sure that it was taking into account the needs of the children um, as they work, we all worked towards getting them back to school. And in terms of its future proofing, I guess, um, it is not set in stone. Um, the, act, the, the Act actually requires us to continually review whether the strategy needs new things added to it. Uh, the monitoring and reporting structures that we intend to put in place need to be open and influenceable by um, both the key stakeholders and by children and young people who in fact are those most likely to be raising new issues as they need to be taken on board. So the whole I suppose, system of monitoring, reporting and keeping the, the strategy and the, the delivery plan up to date will uh, do all it can to ensure that it is dynamic and able to respond to any changes. Thanks for that, Paul and Jude. That seems like a sensible approach, Paul, to continue to monitor and review um, for any kind of anything else that kind of uh, creeps up. Can I also ask, um, as part of the Children's Cooperation Act, there's an obligation on departments to work together. Um, and there's a provision to allow the pooling of resources. How do you see interdepartmental financing, how do you see the finances operating? Um, do you think this obligation to act jointly and pool resources is sufficient to overcome past fragmentation and drive forward a more unified strategy? Well, I think the Act has, as you say, that provision within it. Um, there are instances, and there have been some very good examples, uh, of uh, pooling of resources in terms of uh, early intervention, the Early Intervention Transformation Programme, um, where there was a cross-department commitment. Those are the sort of things we will be looking for in the delivery plan. You know, I suppose when I refer to, we want this delivery plan to be more than, you know, Department A will do this, Department B will do that. We we're actually even providing a sort of template that, that sort of forces, is maybe too strong a word, but um, requires um, a description of how, the, how, how you will cooperate and what are the sort of levels on which you will cooperate. And resourcing will be one of the areas we will be asking departments to consider whether they need to cooperate in some sort of pooling of, pooling of funds pulling funding way. So um, I think the I think the the capability is there and um, the it'll be very interesting to see just how much um, of that emerges as we sort of push through the next few months into the delivery phase. Yeah, well hopefully that they can all work together and get that there across the line. Um, thanks very much for that and thank you Chair. Thank you Nicola. Daniel McCrossan.
Try to try to or trying to bring me on that. That's you. Uh, Thanks. Okay. Uh, the Children's Service Cooperation Act indicates that, uh, that regard will be paid to the UNCRC in determining what is meant by the well-being of children and young people. However, this strategy goes further and indicates that there will be a... Uh, secondly, are all executive departments now required to ensure that their planning and service delivery are similarly compliant? And will the Department of Education do as it indicated in, 2017, in the 2017 business plan and develop a process to give children, young people and families the opportunity to participate in the development of services and decision making relevant to them? Um, let me take your final point first, the, the participation one, um, and I will reiterate uh, as was what I was saying earlier, there's a project in place that's specifically looking at how this becomes mainstreamed in all of our policy making across departments. Um, we, it, we interestingly had a very good um, session a couple of weeks ago with um, our counterparts in Dublin who um, have taken this participation of children and young people really are trailblazers to some extent in, in this area. Um, we're looking at what other jurisdictions are doing also. We've, we're interested in the Welsh model and how they involve children, young people in every aspect of policy making. So there is a programme of work in place um, that will bring uh, together a much more coherent commitment across departments, we hope, um, to do just what you've um, asked. So watch this space and we, we can bring that to the committee in due course. In terms of the UNCRC, I'm not sure I can add much to what we've said earlier in terms of, um, yes, the strategy do, it is uh, infused with UNCRC terminology. There are ob ob oblique commitments to uh, apply the UNCRC um, in uh, decision making. The executive has signed up to the strategy and I think it is what it is. Um, I don't know that we can add much, anyone. I, th I think it's worth considering that um, the key uh, elements that are in the strategy very much were brought to the table by the stakeholders and parents and children and young people themselves. And what we were able to do was actually identify how they are in the UNCRC. So it's not that we were imposing the UNCRC commitments onto the strategy. The base of the strategy was developed from holders. And we were then able to illustrate how what the people in Northern Ireland wanted for their children and young people also mirrored many aspects of the UNCRC. And I think too. I think too now that the strategy is to be published shortly, you will see as new strategies, new service developments come online, you'll increasingly see that the UNCRC is referenced. Uh, those strategies are put into the context and the articles of the convention are taken into account. For example, the looked after children strategy or the online safety strategy are all very much embedded in the context of the convention. Okay, thank you. Um, under the children and young, uh, under the children and young people learn and achieve outcomes, the strategy refers to non-formal education and engagement for families in respect of LAC and newcomer children. Can the department explain what is meant by non-formal education and how this can help LAC and newcomer children? Well, non-formal education would look at the totality of children um, who, for example, are coming to Northern Ireland. So not just in the academic setting, but um, how they are supported through um, the public health agency, how the um, asylum seeker programmes are taking into account the needs of children and young people when they arrive in Northern Ireland, um, taking into account issues of language barriers, um, cultural barriers to help them settle in Northern Ireland. So the, the non-formal aspects of education embrace all those things so that um, the children's lives um, can be enriched coming to Northern Ireland. And, and the youth service as well. Um, you know, as you, you will be aware of the considerable 
um, contribution and often not given the profile that it, that it merits um, in the, the overall education and you know, we often use a description um, of their contributions being the non the non formal education yeah. um, contribution. So um, they have a very significant interface with newcomer children and young people, um, and indeed, um, you know, I'm aware that in many cases have adapted and adjusted programs interventions accordingly. Yeah, early years as well would fall under that category. So before the children reach the age of formal education. Okay, the signal is quite bad here, it's cutting in there. Um, thank you very much for that. Uh, finally, the, the strategy refers to children with a faith not being uh, stereotyped and having their faith-based views respected. Uh, the strategy also appears to indicate that children of no faith should not be obliged to comply with activities or practices with which they fundamentally disagree. General Department of stereotyping ch of children of faith will be discouraged and also General the Department has indicated that there is an absolute and unquestionable right of withdrawal from both collective worship and RE under Article 21.5 of the 1986 Order. Does this mean that children of any age at a maintained or controlled school can withdraw from RE or acts of collective worship? Uh, and is parental permission required in that regard? Um, well, you, the committee wrote to us on this issue and we uh, gathered a response. Uh, it's not an area that we would be the policy experts in. Um, I, can only, I can only read it uh, the way you're reading it. And in terms of your sort of final questions around um, would parental response, would parental consent be required? It's required, but we will we'll check with our colleagues who look after that area and get back to you. Okay. Okay. Uh, and the final question, Chair, the, the strategy indicates that on a, a, an online safety strategy for children and young people will be developed from the Department of Advice on the likely timetable for the development of the online safety strategy. Uh, again, that's not an area that we, we're responsible for. I understand that a paper is going to the executive quite soon, um, so I, we, we can ask the Department of Health who are leading on that and get you a timetable for that. Okay, thank you, Chair. Okay, Daniel. Robbie Butler. Yeah, uh, you got me, sir? Sure? Yes, thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thanks to uh, Paul, June, and, and Trina. Uh, I think a lot of the questions that I was thinking about have been asked, but I do have a couple of other uh, interests, and I haven't, to be honest, I haven't been able to go through the whole uh, strategy to see if they've been included, but I would be surprised they haven't because it does seem to be pretty, pretty comprehensive, but I have a, a number of interests. Uh, I sit in a number of all party groups, so I know there's a lot of content in there in and around addressing mental health, resilience and those type of things. Um, and you discussed a little bit about online stuff, but in regards to um, uh, the prevalence of addictions uh, in young people, whether that be gambling, drugs and alcohol, the prevalence of it and the ability for young people to access uh, those things and then obviously the, the very well reported poor outcomes uh, for young people when they start on those um, tracks at an early age. Has that been picked up in the strategy? Certainly reference to um, addictions has been covered in, in the uh, health and well or health, mental health and physical health outcome. Um, it has been flagged by um, our colleagues in the Department of Health. And I know they have particular um, detailed strategies that they're working on to consider this issue. Um, and this is where the ongoing monitoring comes in. Um, if more work is required in any of those areas, then um, as from a strategic point of view, looking right across all aspects of children's lives, the strategy and the executive will be able to support improve in those areas. But I know that um, certainly the Department of Health and public health agency have quite a lot of detailed work on that. Yeah, that's grand. I, I know there, and that's the inter you raise an interesting point because uh, we potentially are at an exciting road of transformation with regards to, to young people uh, and their outcomes uh, educationally and in health. And there are a, a lot of strategies being developed. Um, in terms of the, the crossovers, has, has there been any scoping done to identify just exactly uh, how many strategies there are that speak into perhaps this one? And, and, and I'm thinking in terms of the efficiencies here to make sure there's not duplication of work, there's not competition for, 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 for content, because 
I think one of the things where failure can actually happen, and it's unintended at times, is that you have different departments doing the same thing, coming up with slightly different maybe solutions and so on, um, and then you, you lose maybe the, the good of what you were intending to do. So is there any fear um, with this strategy? Because it is a very broad strategy and it does cover a lot of ground that, that the, exactly. the, the, the right people aren't talking to each other. Yeah, the guidance for the con contributions to the delivery plan started at that point, um, requesting that if, if a department was deciding to bring forward a new action, for example, just to take your example on addiction, then their first step is to look across, we're asking them to look across all other departments and see who is already working in that area and to connect with them to see whether a cooperation can be undertaken to work together on this issue. So that's the first step. Um, the delivery plan also um, requires them to identify the partners they are working with on any particular strategy. Because exactly what you're saying, Robbie, we want to open out um, any overlap. Um, children's services and provision for well-being for children has already happened. It's ongoing. So the key thing that this strategy is trying to do is identify the gaps, identify the duplication and bring forward improvements. So you hit on exactly what we're trying to do here. Um, and I, I think we would see the delivery plan that we see this strategy as sitting at the top of the pyramid. You know, it is the strategy for all children and young people's issues. And within the delivery plan, I would expect to see reference to other strategies where, where commitments are going to contribute to this very high level object set of objectives, but it's going to be driven through another strategy uh, so you will start to see almost how they sit within the three of, of strategies but yeah brilliant no, th thank you i think it's it uh, yeah it, it, the it, it looks good and, and all the terminology is good but um as you said the delivery is really important so i, I like the way that that sits um here's one here and i'm, I'm going to probably struggle to get my, my tongue around this and explain where i see uh, um, it's not a difficulty, but hopefully it'll be picked up in the strategy through one of the, the, the other strands. So um, more and more we see um, families breaking up. Um, so you have, you have children living um, either with, with mum or dad or a combination of both. But very often they get caught um, sometimes in um, an acrimonious split. And sometimes they're, they're very hard to identify. Um, but it's well known and well reported that, um, and I did let's say a little bit in the in the in your report that sort of sort of skimmed across the top of it that um, all of these children do deserve access to both mum and dad, um, and some of the outcomes for children as they grow up when they don't have uh, equity of access to both parents can can be difficult. Uh, has that been addressed in, in any of the strategies that feed into this? Do you know. Um, it, it certainly is, is included in our strategy. We're very aware of that situation. Um, statistically, you know, it's a one and two um, marriages or relationships break down. So the goal really is that the strategy builds in support um, for those children and young people and support for the parents to um, help make that situation as, as, le as less acrimonious as possible. Um, the, the, the way it's drafted in the strategy, we can't prevent families breaking down, but the goal is that we support families and support parents to make that situation, both during the breakdown and afterwards, um, as, as um, good as possible for the children's experiences. It's very key. Um, you'll see that the Family Mediation Service is identified there in the strategy. Um, the role of Family Mediation is very key in this area and the role of um, the court system and whether um, uh, the courts are the right place to consider that. It all flows from the strategy into those areas. Um, and I would say that's very key, in my opinion, Rowan. No, I so, think that, yes. Sorry, in terms of the specific <coughs> strategies that links to the children's strategy then, uh, the, the actions would flow from the review of family justice will link with that particular area of great focus. Okay, that's Brilliant. No, I, I, I agree with 99% of what you said there, June. The only bit that I wouldn't agree with is that uh, with one and two families breaking up, there's not much, there's not we can do about it. I think actually as a, as a, as a, as a society, we should, be, we should be trying to, to address that. Um, I think that it's not, it's not for your strategy to get that, but um, in terms of 
whether it's tackling poverty, whether it's talk, you know, targeting whatever we need to target, I think it's something that um, uh, we should be maybe addressing. That would be a nice preventative measure as opposed to trying to pick up pieces. But absolutely, absolutely. Um, I, I, and, and yeah. initially it was drafted in that way, and we were challenged that we could not um, prevent <laughs> breakdowns. So we, we we turned it around the other way. But I, I understand what you're saying. I, I, I could accept that. I wish that have been at that meeting. <laughs> I'd have poked somebody in the eye. So listen, thank thank you so much for for your input, guys. Thank you, thank you, Chair. Thanks. For Thanks, one of the other strategies that we're linking with is the family and parenting support strategy which the Department of Health is leading on so hopefully that will give a, an opportunity to put in some of the views you've just said Brilliant, I'm looking forward to that Thank you so much Thanks Robbie William Humphrey Thanks Chair um, Good morning and thanks very much for your presentation this morning um, First of all can I say I welcome the joint upness around all of this it's, it's really encouraging and something which I think is needed across government both regional and local. In terms of the executive strategy, I think you mentioned health, education, justice, communities, and the Children's Commissioner being involved. Um, can I just ask you to expand on that and how you actually managed to take that forward? Do you want to describe the project? Yeah. Um, the, the development of the strategy was set up as a project, um, and members were invited to take part on a project board. Um, and supporting the project board, we had children's champions from all nine departments. Um, so the, the members met monthly on a monthly basis um, and the papers um, and issues moved forward um, as we developed them, um, taking people's views into account. And they were submitted to this cross-departmental board to seek their input and views and agreement before we moved on. So it was very much um, a cooperation-based approach to project management and it worked very well. Uh, I'm not. It certainly was very lively at times, um, but it, it meant that there was lots of input right across the departments. Wider consultation. Do you want to mention the wider consultation? Yeah. Um, yes. So in the development of, of the strategy um, supporting the project board, there was an ongoing um, co-design process. So um, we um, had a range of meetings with all um, volunteering community organisations who wanted to meet us, um, some 40 meetings at least. Anybody who had a view, who wanted to contribute to the co-design were welcome and, and uh, we met with them, we listened to what they said um, and we compiled that so that we could include, uh, where possible, um, it in the strategy. So it was an ongoing, very wide approach to um, development and, and contributions from views and that included the children and young people as well. Um, uh, that's that good uh, and I very much appreciate that so 40 community and voluntary organisations were involved in, in, from the youth sector, were they? Uh, from right across the board, um, whether it was looked after children, um, whether it was children in the justice system, any, any youth organi any organisation who looked after children from any aspect of their lives, if they wanted to um, talk to us about the stra strategy and contribute, they were um, welcome to do so, and, and we met with them all. We, we okay. So when you say if they wanted to talk to you... Um, yeah. Uh, did you write and ask them if they wanted to talk to you? We did. We had an ongoing um, sort of uh, news update um, we put on the departmental website every month, so or, or every couple of months. We gave them a step forward as to where we had got to, um, and we sought their views. So on an ongoing basis, um, they would have come back to us. Um, so they were they were welcome. I, I don't know if you know a lot of the, the organisations in the children and young people sector, I'm sure you do. They're very vocal, they're very passionate about what they do and look after children and young people. So they, they just came to our door uh, and we, we listened to everything that they said. Um, and we could also see that in then the formal consultation. We uh, arranged uh, nine, seven geographical events across Northern Ireland to seek views from the community, from stakeholders, parents and young people. 19 voluntary and community organisations, youth organisations came to us and said, we would also like to be involved in this. We worked with them as well um, and we went to every meeting that we were invited to to listen to what people had to say about the consultation document and just kept moving it forward um, and making a note of what they said and trying to encapsulate it in the document. So did that include the uniformed organisations, like Scouts, BB, GB oh, yeah. and so on? Yeah. Okay. It did, it did okay. indeed, yes. Yeah. Good. Because uh, quite often, unfortunately, they're left out. Um, in yeah. terms of um, tackling paramilitarism, which was mentioned in your presentation as well, um, can you expand on uh, what work you've been doing around that issue? 
um, it, it isn't in our a policy area that, that we would be uh, able to speak to, unfortunately. Uh, Mr Humphreys, um, we have included it because we know it, it is very key. Um, it's mentioned in the new, pro, or new day, new, New decade. New decade, new approach document, and, and it was in existence before that. So it's flagged as a very important area of focus. The mechanisms and the people who are involved in that wouldn't be an area that we uh, sort of could, could speak to, but we can certainly follow that up yeah. for you. I know my colleagues in the youth service and in the EA um, youth service are very much involved with the TEO and the Department of Justice on that mm -hmm. programme. Yeah, well, I, I, I mean, I, I would pay tribute to uh, the, the, the youth service, uh, they do a fantastic job. Uh, Arlene Key uh, uh, gives leadership there in my area. Uh, Mark, Mark McBride and his team do fantastic work. But look, the issue is in, in, in the areas that Mr Newton referred to and sort of the more deprived areas where there are huge um, socioeconomic difficulties, educational uh, attainment and underachievement and so on. Um, these are huge issues because obviously that's where paramilitarism uh, is more prevalent than in others. And I think on that issue, uh, this is not to take away from the work that you've done because I'm encouraged by it, but there needs to be a joined upness in those areas so that holistically these things are tackled. Yeah, I would certainly hope that the um, current uh, expert panel who's looking into educational underachievement um, would be connecting with those policy areas and programmes to see... Yeah. Where the linkage comes in, and, and the, the, the well, I'm panel not, on under. I'm not sure. You can just, I'm not sure. I mean, I I know some of those people, and I, I'm very much in support. I'm not sure that is their role, actually. I mean, okay. the, uh, in in, ter in terms of the the issue around paramilitarism, you know, they will have enough work and enough scope and work that they're doing to 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 bring forward some proposals to address those issues that are that are um, long running issues. Um, but I, I just think that there needs to be. You, I mean, mention was made of TBOC and so on. Um, that will be more, TBOC will be more, um, I'll be careful how I say this, TBOC will be more um, readily accepted in some communities than others, let's put it that way. And so therefore, there, there, you know, there, there, is a, there is a job of work to be done around these issues. Can, can, we, can we take what you're saying and sort of almost reflect on that as we get the contributions to the delivery plan in this area? Like, as I say, our work on that is a sort of ongoing challenge. There's a challenge function around that where um, we feel, you know, that more or I suppose more extensive contributions are required. So we have an opportunity to sort of squeeze things out a little bit more where we don't think we're getting from departments all that we need and we'll take what you you've said um, into consideration in doing that in terms of the panel on underachievement they're actually quite interested in the strategy and in the implement the delivery plan as a potential um i suppose vehicle um, to take forward some of the recommendations that they may well um come up with i've had a couple of sessions with them um, and I think the timing here is, you know, spot on to some extent that as they start to bring out their proposals around, well, what are the things that need tackled to address this educate persistent educational underachievement? We are at the same time, hopefully coming out with a delivery plan um, to improve the lives of children and young people. So there is a clear synergy there. No, I think the, I think the... Um timing is is very fortunate okay thank you very much thanks Chair. thanks william just just to build on um some of the questions william said there paul um the tackling paramilitary activity criminality and organized crime executive uh action plan recommended that the executive take action to set ambitious targets and milestones to measurably reduce segregation in education as quickly as possible uh, are any such um, ambitious targets and milestones included in the children and young persons strategy? Again, that would be within the delivery plan, and I don't know what has been proposed to date from in that area. But we can certainly, again, take a look and see what people have contributed and push further. On that area, I suppose um, the high-level step would be that the fact that um, the minister announced the review of education 
um, would be the first strategic point that would be covering that aspect. Okay. Can I bring in Justin McNulty, please? Thanks. Justin, are you on mute, maybe? We can't hear you so far. That might be for the better. That's you, sure. no. That's you, no. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. Thank you, June. Thank you, Drina. A very comprehensive piece of work, a very exciting piece of work, a very important piece of work. So well done on your work to date. And in terms of the final iteration, there is still scope for a uh, revision here before this is actually legislative for it. Um. I think it would. I think we would prefer not to have to make a change to the strategy document at this stage. Like it has been around all departments, all ministers, the executive has agreed it. Um, I wouldn't say never. If there was a major omission or problem that you identified, there is a real opportunity to influence the delivery plan um, and the population indicators, which we've talked about which um, really uh, will be where the focus moves to. You know, the strategy sets that overarching direction. We then start to look at well, what's everybody going to do about it? Um, but what I, have you something in mind? Yeah. Well, in terms of the individuals and organizations who consulted with, we actually did um, respond to the consultation, right? There were 132. Were there any notable omissions? Not that I'm aware of, but that, that's quite difficult. Certainly no one said, no one made a point of saying we're not planning to respond to this consultation. Well, in terms of, in terms of your, from your perspective, would you have said there are organisations who you would have expected to be part of this consultation who were not? I, I don't think so, to be honest. Um, it was very, very wide um, and we were, we were willing to talk to, to every organisation who wanted to contribute because they all were looking at different aspects of children's lives. Um, just on reflection of what you're saying there about is there room for a large change, um, when we examined the previous strategy, which was developed away 2002, 2004, and came into being 2006, there is no mention of the internet or of online safety or bullying or any such threats there. So I think at that time when the people wrote that strategy, they thought they'd caught everything. And yet within 10, 15 years, something did come up that was totally unexpected and unknown. Um, in the same way as the pandemic has arrived this year. So yeah. the strategy is structured in a way that, of course, if there's something as fundamental as the internet, for example, arrives on our doors, yes, we will address it. Um, below that, if it, depending on how material it is, it may already be addressed at a high level. The, okay, well, the, reason, the reason I asked, I, don't, I didn't see any sporting organization involved in the consultation. I find that surprising. None. Right. Um, I see there's no there's no reference to sport at all within the, the document. Um, I can find that extraordinary. Yeah, there is because um, it links directly to the, the sport um, strategy in the Department for Communities. And we actually have been working with them as they develop their new strategy. Um, we've actually been linking with schools and linking with children and young people to bring their views on sport and put it into that specific strategy. So it's embraced in that children enjoy play and leisure. So play and leisure in all its forms, whether it's in the arts, whether it's in sport and physical activity, it's right at the highest level. So that's why um, we didn't want to push it down any particular road, but we knew that our colleagues in Department for Communities address sport, and they in fact are looking wider um, at sport in the widest leisure context. Well, I still, I still find it extraordinary. Yeah, I see. You know, I understand that rationale, but I still do find it extraordinary that sport isn't referenced in a children and young people strategy because we're talking about mental well-being, we're talking about physical well-being, we're talking about emotional well-being, of which sport can be a huge, a positive yeah. contributing factor. And I think yeah, it's yeah, extraordinary. I agree. Sport yeah, in I agree. Um, what, in terms of saying that you'd like to have a reference to sport, oh, but that would be very, very strongly so. Yes. Okay. Um, Paul, you said that, that Dublin are the trailblazers. Can you tell me more on that, please? Yes, they, um, about 10 years ago, I think it was, maybe more, um, 
really saw the need to involve children and young people in, um, right across government in terms of policy, influencing policy. Um, they set up a unit uh, within one of the departments. They've uh, got structures in place that are re regional as well as Dublin centric. Um, so there's actually regional, um, uh, a regional structure that ensures that the voice of children and young people is captured and fed in. Um, they can demonstrate how they have listened to children and young people. It's not just about taking views and then doing nothing with them. How they actually change their thinking on various policies. Um, I remember speaking to a colleague in the sort of early years um, piece, and you know she was saying how they even engaged with young children, um, you know, three-year-olds, four-year-olds, around what sort of environment they like for a sort of early years childcare um, setting. And, you know, the sort of feedback coming back was, well, we like to sit on sofas, not on, you know, ad big adult chairs. We want somewhere that's comfortable. We want somewhere that's a bit like home. You know, messages could come through. And if you talk to the, the user, even those very young, early stage users, and they have they've taken. There's a professor at Queen's called Laura Lundy who has developed a whole model, sort of academic model of engagement. The Irish adopted her model, and um, her model is seen to be pretty much world class now. And um, we've been engaging with her too on well, what might we need to do uh, here to sort of uh, uh, bring some of the best of that into our approach. So um, I'm sure the that there would be no issue, I would have thought, if the committee wanted to find out a bit about um, you know, the, the approaches being used in other jurisdictions, we could prepare a paper and provide that to you. It would be difficult to have them present before a committee, but that would be an interesting dynamic, dynamic I can imagine. So, uh, Chair, can we get the, the Irish government in to, to present on the Children and Young Person Strategy, I uh, propose that. Um, I haven't, haven't, haven't taken advice from a, a Northern Irish professor that <laughs> people seem to have taken advice from. Anyway, that's just... <laughs> incredible, incredible, yeah. Um, in terms of um, outcomes, values, sorry, in terms of the values and principles, um, I'm a bit surprised that um, honesty is not one of them. I think dealing, when dealing with children and young people, so this is a personal comment, I just find it surprising that honesty is not front and centre in terms of it, you know, young people's strategy. I do also note, in terms of what Robin said earlier, there are measurements, uh, measurement in, referred to in twice in the document, on page 16 and page 102, so you have that that's there, because if you're not, that's yes and you're guessing, so that's crucially important. In terms of, can you tell me more about roots of empathy? I know it may not be necessarily specifically referred to, but also it's a little illustration in the in the strategy document. Can you tell me more about Roots of Empathy, please? Okay, yes. Roots of Empathy is a programme that uh, the Public Health Agency um, deliver in partnership with the Belfast Trust. Um, now, it's on quite a small scale, um, but it's based on um, people going into schools and talking to quite um, young children, primary school children, um, about their experiences and they actually um, bring a baby into the, the, the classroom with them, um, with the mother, and the children l learn about the baby and talk to the baby and it helps them understand how their feelings evolve, you know, when the baby smiles, when it doesn't smile. Now, I'm only giving you a very, very um, brief synopsis of it there and again, I can provide you with more information but a highly effective program on helping and evidence supported to show help children, especially children who have um, experienced trauma um, in their lives or come through, as Robbie said, um, family breakdown and, and it has left um, scars within their, their hearts. Um, it very much helps those children to open up and um, see the world around them and see themselves differently and better. Um, I can provide you with more information with it. Um, I know the PHA would love to deliver it to every school in Northern Ireland, um, but financially not possible. But certainly the work that they do with the Belfast Trust and, and the schools that they're able to go into, very effective. That's extraordinary. Uh, brilliant. And the last thing I want to say is um, in terms of 
children and young people acting as carers. And you mentioned that you know attainment in, in school is more much more than just about grades. And those young people who do that have to be recognised through whatever mechanism possible because they're way above and beyond what any grades can say on a, on a report sheet, what them children have been through and how they've, how they've grown straight, straight through that, that experience. And um, so we very, very much support that, that angle that you're, you're proposing. And, and this is where we're hoping that this strategic document that is um, bought into by the whole executive will help direct funds to where it's needed, like looking after young carers. So you can see the connection there. Um, yes. That's the, that's the opportunity. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much for your, for your evidence, guys. Thank you so much. Thanks, Justin. Morris Bradley. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Uh, Chair, most of the questions that I had in mind have already been, been, been asked. I think Daniel asked them all for us. Actually, it was one of the questions that Daniel raised that, I, that I'd be very interested in making a comment on, uh, and it was the question uh, regarding children of faith. I think da Daniel referred to children att attending controlled schools or Catholic maintained schools not having their faith stereotyped. There was no real answer to this question. Uh, in my opinion, some instances of school is the first and only time children may avail of Christian worship. And I feel it is important to bear this in mind. I actually see the statement uh, as an erosion of faith and a lack of promotion of faith. And I'd like to see uh, the, the, the committee elaborating that issue when they come back. Uh, I would like a fully defined response to the question, as a matter of fact. Uh, I'd also make reference to the strategies, the eight outcomes. I would ask you, is there a great deal of duplication in the strategy of work already taking place within the youth service, community groups, sports clubs, youth organizations, youth clubs, etc.? Could you explain how duplication has been identified and avoided? Um, well, on, on the faith one, um, we've, we've, as we've written to the committee, um, we're happy to take away your request that you get more detail on this. Um, and uh, if you want to, as Clark, maybe you want to sort of we'll, we'll formulate exactly what you would form you would like that in, whether it's a, a briefing session or whatever. We're happy to do that, but we're so it's not the policy people um, that lead on that. I, I certainly reading the strategy, I don't see it as a as a dilution um, of of the, the status quo. It's sort of uh, recognizing absolute respect for those of faith and those who have no faith. Um, and the objective is to secure the rights um, of, of both of those groups, but we, we're happy to follow up on that. Um, in terms of duplication, well, I suppose as, as June has said, when we, when we go out to departments now to ask them, well, what are your actions? We have no intention of duplicating um, activity that's already in train or that's going to be covered under another strategy. It will reference where that's going to take place. One perfect example of where we're trying to avoid duplication is at those population level indicators and the programme for government. There would have been a real risk here that the things we measure around this strategy at the highest level are also the same or different things being measured by the programme for government around children and young people. So the team here have been working with the team and programme for government to try and make sure that the two become one. And you know, the question is how far you can take that. Our view would be we would like to take it to the point that our reporting on this strategy becomes the reporting, the programme for government reporting for children and young people. So you don't do it twice. So we're very mindful of the risk of duplication here. Um, and I think we have safeguards in place and arrangements space to try and minimize it as best we can. Morris, you still there? Yeah, sorry, I had muted. Uh, no, thanks very much for that. For those people. that that'll be me in the meantime, Chair. Uh, what do you think about there? Thank you. Thanks, Morris. Okay. There you are. Okay, Paul, June, Drina, thanks very much indeed for your presentation today. There's obviously a wide range of issues for us to follow up there with you once we get to implementation and delivery plan phase. 
Um, we look forward to doing that. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> okay, members, can I ask the clerk to summarise any actions following that briefing? So, Chairperson, if I can ask Assembly Broadcasting to remove the witnesses and add the members back into the spotlight. So, I think quite a few actions there. Uh, I think the committee is right into the department seeking an informal briefing on the details of the Children and Young Persons Strategy and how that's all going to fit together. Um, additionally, seeking sight of the implementation plan and uh, how it's going to reduce division in education and society, but also I think just the details of that implementation plan. Additionally then, um, the committee I think is calling for joined upness around uh, tackling paramilitarism and asking that this be reflected in the delivery plan for the Children and Young Persons Strategy. Additionally, Members are calling for the inclusion of sport in the strategy, given its important role in uh, emotional health and uh, mental well-being. And also, I think we're looking for a paper from the Department on youth engagement and uh, how this has been done in this and in other jurisdictions. Um, and there's more. Um, I think we're looking for information around religious participation. So there's the question that Daniel asked about parental permission for non-participation, and then the issue that Morris raised about the avoiding stereotyping and the sort of undermining of, of uh, children of faith. Um, we're also looking for the timescale for the development of the uh, online safety strategy. And I think that is all that I got. Members, have I missed anything, Chairperson? Well, thank so, members. Yeah, yeah Justin. Uh, yes, can we invite the relevant departments from the Dublin government to present to our committee to tell us what they're doing? They're they're the trailblazers. Can we learn from them? Do you want to write Never, down? never. Oh, I think it's Daniel. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure it was. Sorry. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, we, we could we could certainly write to the department. Uh, the relevant department to find out what, what they're doing in that regard. I'm not sure which is the relevant department, so I'd have to ask. Probably about education affairs, probably. Yeah, we'll ask, we'll ask so, DA so officials. Okay. It is, though, so uh, just, just, I just don't know which department to write to in the. Uh, Check out with department the officials. Is that okay? I will, but is yeah. the case then that you want them to brief on what they did in Dublin? Is that, if I've understood that correctly? Could we get the department from Dublin to brief us in terms of what they're doing? Yes, that, that's what I'm saying. So yep. it, it is about what happened in Dublin and uh, the, the youth engagement well, that they undertook. Is that correct? Yeah, perhaps you could add the, um, the professor that was referred to from Queen's University as well that the, the Irish government had based a lot of their strategy on. That would be helpful, Justin, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Okay. We can invite. I don't know if they will. It's up to them whether they come or no. But yes, just chairperson, will do. Okay. If that is agreed. 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 Okay. Thank you. Agenda item 10 then, Clark. Forward work programme. Is that right? Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, can I refer members to the draft forward work programme at page 665? Uh, advise members that briefings have now been scheduled until Easter, but can of course be adjusted as required, um, including a briefing in early January on the monitoring round and budget. Do you need to add anything to that, Clark? Well, I think members have added a few things today, so <laughs> I will I'll, um, update the forward work programme and we can um, have a look at that again in January. OK. And can I... Do we need any endorsement of the work programme as it stands, Clark, or happy to I return to that in January? There are a couple of changes which I okay. um, already put in. As you can see, I've actually I've booked us out to Easter now, so okay. um, I can, there's a, a few slots remaining um, which we can okay. put in. Uh, OK. Um, Agenda item 11, then, is any other business? Um, members, could I just raise uh, another item of business? I probably should have raised it earlier, but um, given at the late stage that we're at, um, would it, and Clark, it may or may not be possible, but could, could I propose that we write to AQE and PPTC um, to seek how um, each body will ensure delivery and facilitation of transfer tests in January within the Health Protection Coronavirus Restriction Number 2 Regulations, Northern Ireland 2020. Members be content for us to do that. Yeah? The answer. Agreed? OK. Um, ideally, it, it would be good to write to the schools permitting the use of their premises for the AQE and PPTC, Clark, but is that a significant undertaking? Or? I don't know who they are. OK. I don't know which schools those are. Okay, well, we'll go with AQE and PPTC to see how 
um, those bodies and the schools that they're working with are able to do so within those regulations. Members content? Great. Okay. Any other business members? Uh, Chairperson, the department just responded to indicate that the um, text that uh, the committee was shared with the committee today was, I think they're saying, was shared with principals on the 8th of December. Okay. Uh, I, I think it's different text, but okay, that's fair enough. That, that's, that's the response of the frame, fair enough. Um, okay, any other business members? No? Okay then, uh, date and time of our next meetings. We, we have quite a few. Um, the committee will meet informally on Friday the 18th of December, this Friday, by Starleaf at 10 a.m. with Department of Education officials on the uh, plans for uh, period poverty. Um, we will also meet on the informally on the 6th of January to undertake effective questioning, uh, refresher training, and to conduct committee planning session. That'll be at room 29 and on Starleaf from 10 a.m. Obviously important we, we um, come prepared for that uh, to plan for the new year. The committee will also meet informally via Microsoft Teams on the 12th of January at 9.30 a.m. to discuss, uh, or sorry, with Belfast City Council Youth Forum uh, to discuss uh, RSE work they've been undertaking. And then our next formal committee meeting is scheduled for Wednesday the 13th of January in the Senate Chamber at 9.30 a.m. Members content with all those arrangements? Okay, then that just leaves me to wish all members and staff a safe and happy Christmas and a, a peaceful new year and to thank you all for the, the work we've been undertaking this year. Okay, folks. Daniel, yep. Give us a song there now before you go. Get us into the Christmas spirit. <laughs> what did he say? I think he wants to. He's looking for a song. A song? <laughs> no, you, you haven't heard me sing and you don't want to. Okay, folks, uh, have a have a very safe and, and happy Christmas. And um, obviously, we'll continue to um, work on behalf of the education sector during this time. Thank you. Thank Meeting you. is now adjourned. Sorry. All, right. no, sure. All the best. Thank you.